morning. morning. It's nice to be back after my week away. Last Sunday really wasn't a day off. I was preaching at my former congregation, uh, which was quite an honor. It was kind of like going home. Uh, Judy and I have said, I could cry again. Outside of burying our parents, the hardest thing we ever did was leave that church. But in all truthfulness, the best thing we did was come here. And so it was great to be back there. Um, my, one of my old organists actually played for the service. And I say old, she's about 90 now. Okay, and she didn't quite play as good as Mel. So, but it was a joy to be there. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we are doing McRest, but it's changed since the ways we have done it for the past 20 some years. Uh, we're not hosting them on site, and that's due to a number of changes that have been made, kind of McRest made them uh, to receive, continue to receive federal funding. Uh, and so it became problematic to host them in our building. So what we're doing is we're going to a, a, an off-site and we're feeding them there. There's sign-up sheets in the back. It's the first full week of September. We need people to help make lunches. We need all those types of things, just like we used to, except overnight stays and check-in. Uh, we do need help feeding them, so please look at how you may help with that. Also, the LCMS, our Church Bodies Convention, has begun, and we keep them in our prayers today, and we ask you to do the same, that there may be a helpful discussion that's done in the spirit of brotherly love. Uh, finally, and I haven't done this for a while, not since COVID, um, just in case of an emergency. Now, the nice thing about emergencies is we don't think they're going to happen. That's why they're called emergencies, right? Uh, we have exits, not just in the rear, where you guys know, but if you go through the signs that say exit and go this way, there's doors leading you outside if that was necessary. Uh, we do have an AED machine as well if anybody needs it, and please don't, okay? <laughs> um, it's back by the boxes, mailboxes, just to the right of them as you look at them, okay? And so please do remember those things if that comes up. Uh, that's all my announcements this morning, and just give one another a wave, and we'll begin.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Please kneel for a moment of silent reflection on God's word and self-examination. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful me. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of, of the Word, announce the grace of God to you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, that receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 7. Moses reminds the people, You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers, that the Lord who has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistles from Romans, chapter 8. St. Paul writes, We know that those who love God, I'm sorry, we know that for all those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. We read together. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a gnat that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down, and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a house, who brings out his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Sometimes we get up in the morning and we know we need the good news that comes to us from the Old Testament lesson. Maybe you see that bed ahead once again and you wonder, can I be someone's treasured possession. Or you look in the mirror and you know your actions or words or thoughts against those around you, your family, your friends, your co-workers. And you wonder if you could be even God's treasured possession. Or you get up in the morning not sure if you can face the day because of what others have done against you or the darkness you just feel hanging over you. Maybe you wonder, am I really anyone's 
treasured possession. Sometimes we look in the mirror and the good news is almost too good to believe, isn't it? Hear the word of God from Deuteronomy spoken to you today as the people of God. He says, you are a people holy to the Lord, the creator of the universe. You are set apart as his very own. He has chosen you to be his treasured possession, special and unique to him. He has set his love on you. He has bound himself to you in his love. And we look in the mirror, and we know this is very good news. We realize this must purely be by God's grace. That we weren't and aren't holy on our own. That we see we aren't the the best and the brightest, however much we might want to think of ourselves. We aren't the most special and unique out of all other Americans or peoples of the world. We're just kind of your average folks. And God's Word reminds us over and over that we didn't choose Him and said we chose anything but Him. Our own ways of dealing with other people, our own heart deciding what to pursue and follow after in life, our own mind telling us what we maybe need to do or not do to get some sort of life after this one. And yet the God of the universe, the one who made the world and all that is in it, looked down on his fallen, sinful, rebellious human creatures and still desired them, still desired you and me to be with him. He looked on the people he had made and wanted to rescue and redeem them from idolatry and sin and death. And so... He chose good as dead Abraham to be the father of many nations, barren Sarah to be the one to miraculously bear Isaac and keep the promise and oath going. God promised to be faithful to their offspring, to use them to draw all people to himself. And even when that plan seemed stalled and and gone awry, even when the most powerful nation of of the world held their descendants captive, God's love and choice would be undaunted. He brought Israel out of slavery in Egypt with a mighty hand and redeemed them, for they belonged to him. They did not belong to Pharaoh or any other nation or ruler. You are a treasured possession of God. And yet we let the history of the people of Israel become a mirror into our own lives still, and we must must once again marvel at God's grace to us. We confess the time we've grumbled against His goodness. We confess the times we put other people or other things ahead of Him in our lives. We must confess the ways we haven't let His Word rule our lives and the way we treat one another or our families or those around us. And yet God declares to you as he did to his people of old here on the doorstep of the promised land. He says, you are my treasured possession. Titus 2.14 says it clearly. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Yes, God saw and knew your sin. He saw and knew your rebellion against him. But he also saw the eternal ruin and destruction that would bring to you. And so he desired and planned and acted to save you, to rescue you. Yes, in Jesus, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And this is all by God's working, by God's power, by his grace for us in Jesus dying on the cross for us. And so it stands true. As our epistle lesson reminded us, this is all true by the power of Christ's death and resurrection, and since that cannot change, it always stands true. It stands true that you are God's treasured possession, His holy people, His church redeemed with the blood of Jesus. He has set His love on you. He has chosen you by His word and in your baptism. He has placed His very name on you. And he marks you as his own chosen people, called out and set apart as holy out of all the peoples of the face of the earth, not because of who we are or ever will be, but purely because of who he is, as the God of love and grace, the God who keeps his promises, the God who keeps his covenant and faithfulness, whose love for you is more certain 
than life or death itself. It's hard to believe sometimes as we look in the mirror that it is always true in Jesus. He bought you and redeemed you with his blood on the cross that you might be his own and live under him in his kingdom. But God knows the world we live in. He knows how Satan would love for us to rejoin him in his destruction. How the sin within us keeps bubbling up. Luther himself said that the old Adam is a very good swimmer against the waters of baptism. This was true for ancient Israel, which is why when they entered the promised land, God told Israel to be his agents of judgment on the idolatry and wickedness of the Canaanites. After years and years of God being patient with them, he wanted them gone so that Israel would be his very own, so that Israel would not be tempted and swayed by their wickedness and idolatry. For if they were left around, disaster would be courted. And, those, and the people will be enticed away from the living God to, to serve and walk after the idols and the ways of the world around them. And God does not want such to be for his treasured possession. He wants nothing to defile you. He wants nothing to lead you away from him. As Titus 2.14 continues, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Yes, God has cleansed and washed us in holy baptism and he desires us to remain and walk in purity and holiness. He warns us against idolatry and and wickedness that we see around us and the sin that lurks within us. He gives to us not just the cleansing and washing but a delight for his will, a desire to hear his word and keep walking in his ways. It's why he warned Israel of old and why he still warns us of getting too cozy and comfortable with the ways of the world. It's why he warns us about the idols of our hearts, money and power and pleasure and all sorts of things we put above him in our daily lives. God wants us shining as his lights out in the world. We can't just hold up and, and keep it for ourselves. But he always wants us to be wary of being enticed once more by the darkness. But it's why he continues to give us his gifts. The gift of absolution proclaimed to us, here publicly offered to you individually, the gift of absolution that we might not wallow in sin or let it linger in our hearts, but let God come and wash it away and and wipe it away once more. His covenant of faithfulness and love is that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us again from all unrighteousness. It's why he gives us the gift of the sacrament of the altar, that he might bind himself to us in love there as well, to not only set his name on us, but to place himself within us. And indeed, after receiving that gift again today, we'll sing these words, Thy holy body into death was given, life to win for us in heaven. No greater love than this to thee could bind us. May this feast thereof remind us. Lord, thy kindness did so constrain thee that thy blood should bless and sustain me. All our debt thou hast paid. Peace with God once more is made. Yes, you are God's treasured possession. And this is always by his kindness constraining him, his grace and his love that are stronger and deeper than life and death themselves. And so no matter how many good works God does work within us, no matter how much we love and sacrifice with one another and for one another, no matter how mightily God uses us here at St. John to be his witnesses in this world, God's word from Deuteronomy reminds us that none of that makes us his treasured possession. And that's good news, that we are such always and only by his grace and his love and his faithfulness to us in Jesus, our Savior, and that cannot and will not ever change. That, after all, is the way God always works. 
calling one couple, Abraham and Sarah, to start a new people to be his very own, raising up a, a frightened runaway, Moses, to defeat Pharaoh and lead his people, calling Gideon from the least family in the littlest clan to work his rescue from the Midianites, taking the youngest, David, to be a man after his own heart, king and shepherd over his people, calling fishermen like Peter and tax collectors, tax collectors like Matthew to be the first line of his restored New Testament people, converting the most ardent persecutor of the church, Paul, to be his most famous ambassador. None of these were ever perfect. We're made all too aware of the faults and foibles of the so-called heroes of the Bible. We don't get so much as heroes as we do pictures of God's grace, pictures of his love that can't be taken from us, pictures of his continual forgiveness, pictures that we are his treasured possession for the sake of the one true hero of the Bible, Jesus, our Savior. And so, people of God, take heart. You, yes, you, are God's treasured possession. You're redeemed and dearly loved, a treasure of the creator of the universe. You are the item in the field that Jesus purchased, the pearl he valued so highly that he bought you at the price of his blood on the cross. Like Israel of old, this isn't because of anything in us that Jesus chose us and bound himself to us in love, but purely because of his love and his grace. And so let us take heed. Let's presume on God's love and grace and, and mirror the ways of the world around us to assume ahead of time that I can just live and believe as I want. No, God is patient. Yes, he's forgiving. True. But he seeks and desires for his treasured possession also to love him, to listen to him, to rejoice, to know him and his ways more than anything else in this world since we know of Jesus and his great love for us. And so let us follow him. Let us rejoice in him, in Christ and through Christ, and for his glory alone. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God that is far greater than all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds, your treasured possession in Christ. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We thank you, Father, that you have called us in Jesus to be your treasured possession. We are rough and we have many rough edges apart from your son Jesus. But you have called us out of your love that we might know your grace, your mercy, and the joys of eternity. Let us ever live in our lives, in our callings, that we might indeed show forth your glory, not to the praise of ourselves, but that all might know the love of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that your kingdom has come to so many people. And we thank you for those who are gathered here as your family. We pray for those of our members, for Lily Shemansky and McKenna, Tina, Shank, the Shear family, Lucy Schilling, and Marcia Sindewolf. We pray that by your mercies, they might always desire your word and receive it with joy and thanksgiving. We pray for the persecuted church throughout the world, that by your grace, they may find strength to stand in the midst of many struggles and many problems. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the ministry and the mission of your church in this world, we pray that we of St. John would be faithful in our callings to, to proclaim Christ and crucified, that all might know the blessing of being called in Jesus. We pray for the Lutheran Our Ministries, our mission of the month, that they might produce good and faithful works to lead your people into a walk in Christ. We pray as well for charity in Detroit that as she stands as a beacon to all to know your love, you might bless them with hearers who hear in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gifts of this life. We thank you for the gift of marriage and the blessings to the Lozier family, 
to the Vox as they celebrate their 28th anniversary. We thank you as well for the gifts of, of physical gifts, of abilities. And we pray for Nicholas as he travels and competes and to the best of his ability. We pray that you would grant health and healing to those seeking your help. We pray for Denise and for Fritz, who under, both who undergo surgery this week, for Clark, who is recovering from injuries. And we pray that in all things your will be done and that the praise of, our, the praise of God might go forth in the love of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would watch over the leaders of our nation and you'd grant them wisdom and understanding. Be with our president, our vice president, with our governor and all those in positions to make and enact and enforce the laws, that they might be righteous and just and do so, uh, to seeking to bring peace and harmony in this world. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our, our Senate as they meet in convention. We pray that you would bless the, the convention with a spirit that brings peace and seeks to in ways in which to express the love of Christ to all. We pray for the leaders of our church, for President Harrison of the Missouri Synod, for President Davis of the Michigan District, for the pastors, called workers, and lay leaders of this congregation, that they might ever be faithful in their confession of faith and lead all in a faithful walk in that confession. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would use the helping hands you have placed in this world for the betterment of all. We pray that you would watch over and protect and give wisdom to the police, to the firefighters, to EMTs, to doctors and nurses, to all those placed as your helping hands, that by your grace they may be truly agents of your peace and healing in this life. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we pray for the city of Detroit and those of us in our suburbs, that by your goodness you might give the daily bread that is necessary to sustain life. You might provide jobs for those seeking them, and that you might provide faithful employer, employees for those hiring. But we pray most of all that your word would go out powerfully from this congregation and through all Christians that by your grace, many may know the love of Christ in our region. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, into your hands we commit all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, we again invite you to look at the communion policy that is listed in the bulletin, and we ask that you do follow that to the best of your ability. You may bring your offerings forward. Please be seated.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We pray. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy in us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he manifested to us when by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, at his command, and with his own words, we receive his testament. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you for the forgiveness of sins. Just do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, this do in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Amen. God, the Father, the fountain, the source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in the sacrament. We ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.